won't make that mistake again. And we are back between two Yetis on day three, three. slash four of yeah. Met 2017. Well, it's three for Dave Metz and four for Super Yacht Forum, which is the whole of the show. And I'm here today with a guy I've just met called is it Roger Horner with an ER or OR? No, ER. ER. Roger Horner, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How are you doing, sir? Hello, hello. Nice to meet you. A fellow Brit who lives in the, uh, the English expat destination... A Palmer, right? Is that how Mallorca. Palmer, Palmer, yeah, Palmer, yeah, well, in, in, in Mallorca. Yeah. Yep. So Nick's just introduced us. You're a good, fr you're a good friend of Nick's from, from the Palmer. island. Yeah. Do you yeah. know him as Medical Nick as well? Uh, no, I don't. Um, no, I know him as the titled Nick. Oh, the Baron. Uh, yeah, Baron. Baron, Baron, Baron Nick. Von yes, yes, Baron von Holstein. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> so you've just brought out your flats. Domes. Panels. Panels. Yes, panels. yes, panels. Um, but we're not going to talk about those. No, we're not talking about those. You've done that to death. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's I've amazing, actually, because you were at um, Lauderdale as well. And Monaco. And Monaco. Yeah, yeah. So Everyone's you, talking about it, but you've done enough of that over the last... Well, I've just done five presentations and two keynotes yeah, over the last few done. days. Done. <laughs> yeah, so don't ask me about flat panels. No flat panels. It's there. Look at the website. So, <laughs> how did you get into the industry? I know uh, you just re retold me, but I need you to retell me. Okay. Well, I um, started off by um, sailing from knee high to a grasshopper. Um, I was a small boy sailing um, all of the time I, I could uh, get on the water. So I've always had a love of, of the sea, love of sailing. And, sea, um, in, in Kent. Grew up in Kent. Okay. Uh, so I sailed in Dover Harbour when I was at school. Um, my father had a boat on the Medway, a river boat, and, um, and then we broke into, my father bought a, uh, a, a sailing boat, um, a, a Westley Centaur, and then a Southerly 95. And um, when I graduated, I was at Edinburgh University, and I sailed at Edinburgh University as much as I could, almost to the detriment of my degree. And, um, and, um, and um, I studied electronics with industrial management. And um, okay. so that's how I've got into the marine electronics side because of my interest in in um, in, uh, in everything nautical. Um, yeah, I studied electronics and I wanted to get into marine electronics. And when I graduated, I got a uh, my that's first that's job because of your love for being out yes, of yeah, yeah. I got I got involved in I wanted to get involved in marine electronics, and I at that time Decker still existed. Um, Decker, you know, Decker is Decker Radar, D E C C A. Uh, it's a it's a name um, that you, being such a young chap, won't be familiar with. But you yeah. know, from those days, there were Decker Records, and um, ah. there was Decker Records, but there's Decker Navigator, Decker Radar. Anyway, I got a job so with them. I got a job with them from the um, uh, from the milk round from university. Moved me from Scotland down to um, down to Kingston, basically Kingston, Kingston upon Thames. And, um, and but however, just as I was joining them, they were acquired by Raycal, and it became Raycal Decker, and Raycal Decker were into um, electronic warfare in a big way. And rather than getting into Decker Navigator, I was put into electronic warfare, and I was working on radar jamming systems and stuff. And I, it's not what I wanted to do. Holy hell! Yeah, I didn't want to do that. Uh, but however, the best thing that that did is it made me start my first business. Uh, so I've only ever been employed six months of my life, and um, <laughs> and that was the first six months. And then after that six months at uh, to Rachel Decker. I left and started my first business, which was in developing software. I thought at that time the IBM PC was around and there were CPM machines and I thought there was an this opportunity. What, this was, um, my God, this was, um, this was 82, 81, 82. Okay, 81, so 82. the young audience, that places you with cassettes. Mm. There was nothing digital back then. In then, you know, I was talking to, um, uh, Michael from Palladium yesterday, and um, and and we're at similar age, and we were talking about when we started. We had floppy disk drives. Um, you know, yeah, I, had, I had I you had know, floppy flop, little small flop, floppy disk, five and a quarter inch floppy disk drives. And then they went down to three and a half. And no, they they went up to eight inch. That was really exciting. And then we got our first hard drive, which was one megabyte. Yeah. 
a white, and it was in a, it was, it was like a, uh, like a record deck, and you had to position it somewhere that it was really, really, um, uh, no shock waves or anything, one megabyte, and it was extraordinary that first, that first hard disk drive. Obviously, time has flown since then, and um, we've, that, we've come the, on to where we are. The, the little card in that, mm -hmm. 128 gig. Mm. Yeah, I know. It's unreal. absolutely extraordinary. So, uh, just before you continue with the story, where do you see storage going? Storage is, fortunately, storage is cheap. Um, memory, yeah. memory is cheap, and um, and it's that's really, really important because the future of data. It's yet again another of the keynotes I was in yesterday, talking about yeah. the future of data. Is is um, the um, uh, what we need is obviously massive storage devices to be able to store the hexabytes and exabytes and everything that's coming along, uh, because the amount of data that we are generating from everything now, to do an analysis. One of, one of my ex-business partners was um, uh, he started a cable company down in the Bahamas, um, no, in Phil Keeping. Yeah. Um, you know Phil? No, you, no, I don't. No, no, okay. I'm just being no, polite. Died, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, but one of the key things for him was the um, introduction of the um, the, co the coding. So it made managed to make the TV signal much less. Uh, yeah, yeah, um, basically compression. Compression. That's yeah, right. yeah. So is that what you think might happen? I mean, this is filming in 4K and this file is going to be about 8 gig. Yeah. Yeah, compression's going to get well, clever. Or yeah, well, I mean, the, one of one of the best exponents of, of compression is Netflix. Netflix have done a huge yeah. amount of development yeah. on on compression, such that you know you're you're basically downloading movies over the internet, and um, in and, minutes. And, and, and yeah, and, minutes. And, and and they have fantastic. They've developed fantastic compression, uh, and that that that's something that is is another strand of the data world that, that there are expert companies working on and, and improving all of the time to condense it down. Now because you worked in electronic warfare, yeah. am I right in being told that the military is at least 25 years ahead of what these civilians get on the high street in terms of technology and... I smile. I smile okay. because I can't put. I, you know, I'm still under the Official Secrets Act in terms of what we were doing at it's that particular time. So many people this week who <laughs> signed that extra but, contract. But but <laughs> let me let me tell you a story. I was um, there was a visit into Parma de Mallorca some years ago of uh, the Royal Navy carrier Art Royal. Okay. And. Um, I think it was the Art Royal. It's the one with the, the, the ski jump on the front, which is no longer it's been scrapped. And um, and uh, I was invited on board uh, by the British consulate uh, for the um, sundowner retreat or whatever they they were doing. I can't remember what it was. Very lovely evening, and I was taken onto the bridge um, as a tour around the boat. And they had all the grey electronics that we were developing. Um, when I was working for Raykel Decker, uh, all, all set up in the bridge. And then on the side of the bridge, they had a, a, a plastic PC, white plastic PC, not grey at all, and they were running a chart plotting system on it, electronic chart plotting system on it, um, called um, uh, from PC Maritime, called Navmast. And they said, have you seen this? This is fantastic. Absolutely fantastic! We've got this PC here to trial it out, and I and, and first of all, the Royal Navy uh, do all the data surveying for Admiralty charts, uh, ARCS charts, and they weren't able to use them. They weren't using them themselves because they couldn't. They didn't have the tools to use the ARCS charts that were being used in the commercial world and in the leisure world uh, by lots of other yacht owners. And I, I looked at what they'd got on the bridge there and I said, guys, have a look out the window here. Bridge window over here, there's a couple of big super yachts over here. There's the Lady Mora, there's such and such, such and such over, Ma moored over here. I am going to take you on board a bridge on one of those boats and see what you're missing. This is so old fashioned. We've been installing Navmaster on yachts for the last seven years. And these guys are with Transas and all sorts of other providers. You have no idea what you're missing. So I organized a visit. I got six of the officers and I took them on a super yacht. And I'm not sure whether how much longer they lasted in the Navy. It was, they're so far behind. Behind, not ahead. Behind. 
because they might be in, in electronic warfare, I can't really comment on that, but in terms of navigation systems, they are so far behind because everything has to go through so many levels of approval yeah. before it gets it can be adopted. It is, it's really, I was absolutely shocked and horrified. So when was this? This was like... This was in the, um, the uh, 90s, uh, yeah, the mid 90s. Yeah. Alright, so. Wow, okay. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I you know, this face recognition and stuff that's on the Apple phone now. Yeah. I know that's been there for like 20 odd years, mm. but the operation of it. Yeah, well, I mean, talking about, you know, talking about technology that's been developed by the military, you know, our flat panel um, up here is, is it's, uh, yeah, I'll talk about it. Our flat panel up here is a, is a flat panel communications uh, device, and it was, it's using a new revolutionary technology called metamaterials. Now, people keep confusing this with a product called Phased Array that was a technology called Phased Array that was developed by the military years ago, 20, 30 years ago. And there are other products coming around uh, uh, flat panels for yachts that are use phased array. In fact, everything other than this uses phased array. That was a military development. Now that's cool. You know, they have done some, 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 a lot of forward development before it's come into the commercial, let alone the leisure world. Um, and um, it's, uh, it's so you know, there there are good products that have you know have come through those those channels. Okay. So, you know, it's six of one, half dozen of the other. Yes, there's, there's some things that are so far behind, others uh, are, are, are lead, you know, there's, there's new developments coming from, from that direction. Right, so it's, it's kept its confidentiality. <laughs> so you started your business, electronics. Yeah. Uh, from yeah, so, so UK, UK the, uh, the computer, computer software uh, for financial services and... Um, Financial services companies and estate agents, and uh, pr primarily the main business was insurance broking, was uh, high street insurance broking, and that developed. And I developed a uh, relationship with um, a number of um, uh, companies who were reselling our services. And at that particular time, there was a lot of IBM PC manicness going on in the in the corporate world, and there were a number of blue chip. Uh, PC, IBM PC suppliers to the, all the big um, corporate companies and uh, they all grew rapidly and sold hundreds of desktop IBM PCs and that was the product in those days. It was before Windows, well before Apple. Oh yeah, I, and um, IBM got their leg up in World War II. Yeah, 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 and um, you know IBM was, was the de facto dogs, um, you know, the, 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 the system and, um, and I very nearly said dogs but I have done that. That's I have done that. We can cut that one out. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, uh, every word's been mentioned on the show apart from what was yeah. Gone. And um, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and uh, it's uh, that was the de facto, and a lot of companies became uh, uh, PC distributors became big because they were selling large quantities of IBM PCs to the big multinationals. And IBM's sort of gone now, right? Yeah, well, they know they're still in existence, but they've had to change shape completely. Now, we got a... Uh, we, we got together with um, um, Eagle Star Insurance Company, who rather liked our software, and they would run in their, um, uh, their high street broker offices and putting it on the IBM. So we actually then had a, a joint uh, relationship between Eagle Star um, being the client, IBM providing the hardware, and my little company in those days called Loxton Business Systems providing the software. And this was fantastic. We suddenly had a big break for us rather than selling one-off systems to high street insurance brokers. And that was very exciting. And at the same time, one of the, the, the there, was a, there was a sort of crash in selling just PCs. And all of these big companies were looking for added value. And so um, one of the guys that was selling our, our services, one of the, the PLCs that was selling our company, our services, decided they needed added value. And we they were selling our software, so they wanted to buy our software. So I got uh, an offer made, and we I took the offer, and they acquired the company 100%. But then I became part of a PLC. And um, and I had uh, I didn't have an earnout or anything. We had just had two years uh, uh, to work to, to to run the business. This was at the time also of the Margaret Thatcher recession, 
that hit some, uh, you know, I've um, run businesses through two recessions, but fortunately the Margaret Thatcher recession was the first, and I learned a lot from that for the second, yeah. And um, the, um, and we, um, and we, um, um, had to accommodate uh, uh, dropping costs rapidly and keeping the business afloat, and it was it was very challenging. Anyway, I I I the the, the, the innovation, the entrepreneurship, was knocked out of me in that two years of being part of the PLC and with the recession and everything combined, and um, and I thought, no, this isn't for me. This isn't for me. Um, I got this wrong, um, <laughs> but. Um, um, Packed up the ship and went to Palmer. So I thought, well, what are the options here? Because I'm on a, a non-compete agreement, um, and decided to go sailing. Combination of things in my life. Actually, we were trying to have my wife and I were trying to have children. Um, I were trying to have children, and we were failing um, miserably at the uh, ability to have children. And all of our friends and relatives were on their second, ch- you know, production of their second child, and um, we were, you know, we were. Right? No, it wasn't for the one to trying, albeit, you know, we were consulting, our consultant was the famous Professor Winston, um, who's appeared on the TV a lot over the years, uh, as a Professor Winston, um, and, um, and, uh, oh, the, um, yes, yeah, with the half moon glasses, and, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, he was a fantastic guy, fantastic guy, you know, you mustn't, you mustn't rec- say this, but he did say to me at one point, looking over his half moon glasses, you are doing it, Roger, aren't you? You are, but <laughs> It's like that story of uh, God sending help to this guy who's in a flooded town. Mm. And he's on top of the roof and he sends a guy in a, a canoe. No, 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 I've got, I've, I've prayed to God, he's going to help me. Somebody comes by in a boat. No, 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 I'm good. Somebody, somebody, somebody comes to help me. No, no, no. And he drowns. He goes up to heaven and they're like, what the hell happened? And he goes, well, I was waiting for you to save me, God. I sent a canoe, I sent a boat and a helicopter. <laughs> And the story can be told as well with the rapid the yeah. lottery ticket. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The fucking ticket, Maury. <laughs> so yeah, so um, yeah, so um, there's inter- so so interesting time. So we decided to go sailing because it was something that we could do. We'd go long-term sailing. It's always something um, Nikki and I had all long discussed about going long-term sailing, Dream and traveling. Dream of a boat, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, and, 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 and it would be fantastic to be able to do that. I had a 33-foot, we had a 33-foot Moody at that point, and we got enormously excited about fitting this out. We, you know, we went to a yachting, um, a yachting world or yachting monthly symposium on long-term cruising, got enormously excited, and they suggested, don't buy a bigger boat, use your existing boat, yeah. try it out for a year, see whether it works for you, which is exactly what we did. And it was fantastic. In that first year, just the two of us, we sailed from Portsmouth down, down, to, down to Gibraltar, <laughs> And the only target we had was the Olympics in 92 in Barcelona. And so we sailed to Sitges and we had friends who worked for Coke who got us tickets for everything. We saw Linford Christie win the 100 metres on the, on the finish line. And it was fantastic. And, um, and then we spent... That was the whole Freddie Mercury time, It wasn't was it? fantastic, yeah. It was just... Yeah, yeah, there it was. It was just brilliant. We, as, a result of, as a result of the Barca Olympics, we fell in love with Spain. And um, that was, uh, we didn't have any intention of settling in Mallorca. We were sailing off for uh, wherever. And we got to Spain and we fell in love with Spain following the Olympics. We tried to sail off to Malta for the Christmas, but we never made it. And we ended up circling back and ended up being back in Mallorca for the first winter. We decided then we had had such a fantastic time sailing. It cost us £4,000 that year. And we hadn't, we hadn't at all. It cost, the whole living expenses for a year was four thousand pounds. In the nineties. This was in the nineties, yeah. And um, ninety two, ninety three, and we thought, and we hadn't, st- we hadn't been sitting at anchor peeling potatoes. You know, we'd been in marinas and we'd been out to dinner and, and stuff, and we were living frugally and we were finding the cheapest wine we could, and and stuff. But um, so we either then said we're going to carry on doing this but we won't go across an ocean in a 33 foot sailboat so we bought a bigger boat that winter i found in palmer a, a, a formosa 51 61 foot clipper catch overall and uh, we did a big refit on her with the intention of now going around the world and um so we so we then <laughs> did that refit we did a bit of illegal chartering in the mediterranean for, for a year to get things rounded off and ch- check things out primary illegal chartering basically having friends out um, and all friends of friends out coming with us, and then we sailed That's off. Illegal? 
well, yeah, you you you've got to you you you've got you you've got to be um, these days chartering. You know, you've got to have the boat registered and measured and all sorts of stuff these days. In those days, it was pretty free and easy. Um, and um, so we went off. We then um, oh yeah, right in the middle of this refit. Now we decided to go around the world, um, sail around the world. What is probably the most difficult thing that will affect that decision is to get for Nikki to get pregnant and to have a child when we're not supposed to be able to have children. And um, and so so right in the middle of this, because we decided let's do something that would be really awkward to do if we had a child, we suddenly succeed. So it's law. Yeah. <laughs> so right in the middle of the refit. So we end up with uh, uh, doing our first Atlantic crossing with a nine month old on board with our lovely Lucy, who has long tried for and we, we had, and um, who is now, I'm terribly proud, is in her sixth year medical school. And, um, and, um, the, um, and the, um, uh, we did this Atlantic crossing and we did it with the ARC, the Atlantic Rally for Cruisers. And I think Lucy still holds the Junior Line Honours Award which was um, the youngest ever competitor across the finish line in St. Lucia. And she was 10 months old. <laughs> so that was quite an experience, to say the least. And uh, that's where I learned an awful lot about my future business career, which was actually preparation, preparation, preparation. Think about everything that could happen, because it's the thing that you never think about that's going to catch you out. Yeah, and I mean, I'm not... I like to be a prepper. Yeah. So when the hurricane came through in Florida a couple of uh, weeks, months ago, weeks ago, I was prepped. I had my storable food, I had my batteries, I had my water, so I had tons of water. Everyone was like, why are you storing all this water? Because I had it for a day. Yep, yeah, yeah. Like, you'll see. And I did. Yep. I had my cash pile, I had cigarettes, I had yep. two, um, two sticks of cigarettes for barter, I had fuel, everything. So, yeah, plan yep. for the worst. People coming into the industry. So. You live in Palmer. Yeah. Um, I spent most of my time in Florida, and Florida is regarded as the effort street of America. All the shit flows down yep. south, and so we have a, an appalling work ethic mm -hmm. because there's beautiful weather, beach, and this unbelievable wealth. People just flock there, thinking they can get it all and yep. not have to work too hard. Yeah. Palmer. It's the same kind of issue, it sounds like. Yeah, I mean, you know, we over, over the years, there's a lot of people who want to come to Palmer because they think that they can actually um, be paid to um, have a holiday. Which you said you. <laughs> yeah. Which is you. <laughs> well, 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 you know, in the early, in the early days, I was out there because I, um, you know, I was, I was, I was, I was, I was, you know, having a sabbatical basically. Yeah, you had I was having, yeah, I was having, I was having a sabbatical for four or five years. And um, um, but then obviously it was time to work again, and you know work ethic is is really really important. But we we've had a, a, you know Palmer is a typical place where a lot of people come on holiday, and they stand in front of bars, they rather love it, and they think oh I could run a bar here, and and I could run a bar here. So the next thing they do they buy a bar, and um, um, and they um, they come and start and they have no idea how to run a bar, and it's a whole different ball game standing behind the bar and actually running it than it is standing in front of the bar having fun. And then, and and there are so many, there are so many um, um, failures of tourists who've done that that they funded well. The, the you know these bars are sold over and over and over and over again. And you know the Spanish, the New York econ economy is a massive benefit from from all of these people bringing their money in and losing it there. And we've actually also had people who've actually come to work for us that we've been naive about in the early days, where they basically uh, applied for a, a job. And they just stay the summer and then they resign at the end of the summer because they've actually, it was, it's been a target for them, is actually to come out to Mallorca for three months, actually have a holiday and, um, and earn some money whilst doing it. And then they, they, you can usually tell because they come in smelling of drink the following day and are very tired. They've been partying all night and, um, and um, then um, bang, they're away. Um, it was just a way of getting a cheap holiday. Advice for young people in the industry it's a professional industry now. It's a very professional yes. industry now. And, and it and wasn't they, before. No, it wasn't. It was a toy hobby industry before. Yeah. And, and now it's regulated. There's, yeah. there's exams that are required in every area, which is really good news. 
is that it, it, it's professional and um, it's uh, not uh, a joke. It's not a fun industry. You have to work hard. And we, as e, at E3, we expect good work ethic. We expect passion. We expect intelligence. We expect um, you know everybody to work harder in our industry than they would they would in uh, in, um, in in any other industry. You know, well that's what we just as E3 we we, we expect, and for them to be professional. Yes. Well, Roger, yeah. thank you very okay. much. Um, okay, it's a pleasure. I'm sorry to take you so much of your time during. Um, <laughs> Well, I, I've got a bit of a reputation for talking a lot, so there we go. <laughs> yeah, you and Colin. <laughs> <laughs> okay.